it's time to go back to the brown book. We're going to look at chapter 8. I realize you've already done the um, chapter questions about chapter 8, but I think it's important for us to talk about this. There's a lot of really good information in this chapter, so I'm glad that you've already read through it, and it will be um, review, I guess, at this point. There are a lot of different characteristics that learners have that make up the background within themselves and therefore predict their learning ability. There are certain generalities we can make about boys and girls, men and women, but I want to make sure that you understand the, the basics of these characteristics. Some of them are definitely cultural. Others are biological. The biological ones are consistent no matter what country or nationality somebody is. The interesting part, I think, to, to me, or one of, well, there are a lot of interesting parts of this, but they've done some research, a lot of good research, on gay people, for example, and they found that, generally speaking, uh, a gay woman has a hypothalamus the same size as a man's, which is, is slightly larger than a woman's. Um, a gay man, by contrast, has a hypothalamus the same size, or roughly the same size as a woman's, so smaller than, a, than typically a man. There are other parts of the brain that will likely be changed also, that, that when they look at people who are you know, truly gay, they can check out their brain and they see definite differences among between them and, and the regular straight counterparts. So you gotta sort of take that into account if you're dealing with people who should fall into one category. For example, they should have higher mathematical abilities because they are boys. Uh, better spatial reasoning, perhaps, then, but they don't, you know, maybe that's what you're looking at. It could also be cultural, and it, and it, you see that also in single parent households, so if there's a boy raised by a single mother, then he may think more like a woman. The personality traits uh, also fall into the biological uh, paradigm. Biologists will tell you that the traits and qualities we have sort of harken back to caveman days and they are there for a reason to help us in some way. They're there to help us find food, they're there to help us uh, protect our young. There are a lot of different explanations and it depends on which behavior, which trait you're looking at. But there was probably a, a lot of reason for females to conform and be more dependent. First of all, when a female is pregnant, she can't run as quickly. She needs more calories, more food, and so she needs to be dependent on, in this case, a male, or at least on others, to assist. Now, of course, today in our modern society, these things aren't so, so much true, but this stuff has been bred into us generation after generation. When you guys did your chapter questions, uh, several of you chose to look at the people with disabilities question that was offered. And you were quick to note, as the book says, that half of the people experiencing long-term poverty are in fact disabled. That's a terrible statistic, isn't it? And it really seems like something we could do better at in this country. But we also have this new and improved influx of people with disabilities who in the past would likely not have survived into adulthood. So basically, our medical care is so good that we are in fact creating more people who are likely to live in poverty. Kind of sad, isn't it? I think I've repeated it before, I'll say it again. Mark Twain says our, <clears throat> our humanity is not caught up with our technology. I think it's also important to note here that the level of education of the parents uh, and, and the educational background of parents absolutely does coincide with the academic aptitudes of the children. It seems on the surface like something hard to change, but it's really not. It's actually something really very easy to change, but you have to educate the parents on how to do it. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Cultural characteristics can be super important to how people learn 
uh, and their educational characteristics. So there's uh, certainly uh, age and race, and, but nationality plays a big part. If you're dealing with someone who's from a culture where women, for example, are not allowed to learn how to read, then you can't expect a female from that country or that culture to know how to read. And you can't try to faust your beliefs on them as much as I think all oh, women should be able to read. And if I have a chance, I will probably at least subversively try to help girls learn how to read. The fact is that if I went to that country and I openly tried to push that, uh, that, that point, then I would be putting my life in danger. Now that might be something I'm willing to accept, but this has to be pretty important for you to make those, make those stands. In those countries, Middle Eastern countries in particular, but also some African countries, their explanation for not allowing women to read or go to school is, is that the Quran or their religious texts suggest that women should be submissive to their dominant husbands. Well, well, you could say a lot about that, couldn't you? <laughs> Uh, let's just say I don't particularly subscribe to that theory, but that is primarily because of my nationality. I'm an American, and that unequal treatment is not something that I um, that I feel good about. And I think most Americans feel that way. But at the time, you, you know, if you live in one of those countries, then as a girl, you might want to learn how to read, but it's just the way it is. Now, does that mean it should change? Absolutely, it should change but you have to realize you're swimming upstream. So anyway, if you get one of these people in t here in our country and you're confronted with attempting to educate them, you need to take this all into account. And in those cases, if you've got a woman who has come from a culture where men dominate highly and you really want her to learn something, then you're probably better off making sure there's a female educator to teach her. She will do whatever a male educator tells her to do but she might not intrinsically learn something. She will extrinsically learn it to make the man happy and to keep herself safe. But it's not necessarily the best way to learn. An example of this, how, how big this is right here in the world, you can look this up, you can look Malala up if you don't know her story on uh, Nobel, it's nobelprize.org. But she was recently, well, about a year ago, she was shot in the head in, um, Afghanistan or Pakistan I'm sorry for for publicly stating that girls should be able to read uh, I, I'm not mistaken the way her story started was that some American journalist or maybe British it was some English speaking journalist found her on the street and and was asking her what she thought of girls being educated at the time she was about 12 years old and she said girls should be able to read well she was so articulate and so poised that the journalists kept going back to her for more quotes until pretty soon she kind of became somewhat famous. Now, as it turns out, her father was extremely supportive of his daughter learning to read and being properly educated, but their public stance put them all in danger. Finally, adult men, the Pakistani army, shot her in the head in an effort to silence her. They shot a 13-year-old girl in the head because she wanted all of her girlfriends to get the same education, high school education, that the boys got. She was fortunately flown fairly quickly to a British hospital where she recovered. But if you look at the old pictures of her and her pictures today, you'll see that physically she looks different when she got shot in the head. And probably the only reason she survived was that she had uh, not Middle Eastern health care, but more westernized health care in a place where they thought the girl's life was worth putting a lot of effort into saving. So she was in a, a safe place. She has yet to be able to go back to Pakistan. She's not safe there, clearly. And uh, so she keeps speaking out around the world. And she's on a, a constant tour. She's a smart girl. She's pretty impressive. So here she is. I, I think she's I know, 16 years old now. And, you know, she's pretty amazing. I should probably step back at this point 
and ask your uh, Hispanic and Latino classmates to step in because uh, I can only speak from tangential experience culturally, but uh, my high school was 50%, 51% Hispanic. So I was in the minority in my high school, but where I lived, everybody was Mexican. So when I moved to Las Vegas and I saw the brown people, I, I realized really quickly that there were a lot of Puerto Ricans and they were Cubans and that I couldn't just say Mexican anymore. So where I grew up, it was perfectly fine to say Mexican because frankly, everybody was Mexican. But culturally, I guess I wouldn't want to be called the wrong thing either. And so the, the fair thing to do, the proper thing to do is to make sure that you learn the difference, learn how to tell the difference between one nationality and another. It's the least you can do when you're dealing with other human beings, especially in healthcare. So it's not that hard. There are certain um, physical aspects that vary from culture to culture. I would say exactly the same thing about Asian cultures and Middle Eastern cultures and African cultures. Learning different nationalities is one of the things that we can all do to respect each other's culture. I would say by the same token, if people from other countries really wanted to be respectful of Americans, then besides the different mixed groups we have, racial groups, they could learn the difference between Americans from the northern states, the southern states, California and the east coast or the west coast states. You know, we're all we all have different backgrounds and and learning these, you know, to identify someone's accent, it's it's just a, I don't know, culturally nice thing to do. So it's uh, worth, worth your effort and will certainly help you get along in life. When it comes to uh, medical education, most of these groups, they're primarily Roman Catholic and that may affect some of their healthcare decisions. Traditionally in the United States, we could usually say that someone was either black or white. There were, of course, various and sundry derogatory terms for, in fact, both of those races, one certainly more than others. But more recently, in the last 20, 30 years, Hispanics have certainly caught up in, in, in terms of sheer size, surpa surpassed the uh, African-American community. Uh, it is something I mentioned in in my pediatric class, so I know you probably all heard me say it before, but for medical purposes, I'll usually use the term black because not everyone who has black skin or dark skin is in fact African in descent. A lot of times they are from the Caribbean or uh, other, other countries that in fact just have really dark skin. I'm kind of amazed at how many people think Ethiopians are black. Um, they're more brown to me, but I suppose you could certainly classify them as African American. When in fact, they there's just there's a physical view, a physical difference. Um, same with Egyptians, they physically look different. But um, you know, it's here it is. the The black experience in the United States has been very, very, very different than the white experience, and nothing proves that than the most recent shootings of, say, Trayvon Martin or the, the problems that we've been seeing in Missouri. It's, it's pretty ugly. And these people have been saying out loud to us, to the, to the white community, you don't, know, you don't know what it's like to walk in our shoes. And for so many years, most of the white population has said, you know, you're just making this up. It's just not that bad. And it's taken these, these big movements and upheavals after these really tragic accidents for us to really stop and say, oh, you know what? It's, it, I guess they weren't really making it up anymore. But I think in these cases, the reason we're suddenly seeing it and hearing it and it's become such a big deal really quickly is Facebook and Twitter and social media in general. Because now when police are shooting unarmed people, someone whips out their phone and takes a video of it and it's online before the body gets cold. And, and it's making us angry as it should, but maybe, maybe this anger will actually help us fix some of the, the lagging areas in their education and their lifestyle. So 
Maybe this will help us pull people out of poverty. Maybe this will help us as a community, as a whole, as a, as a nation decide we want everyone to be equally educated. I don't know, but, but maybe it will help. Maybe it will, be, maybe it will be this, these tragedies that will help us, all the rest of us say it's not acceptable that a third of your population lives in poverty. And it's not acceptable that roughly half of your young men are imprisoned at some point. They can't statistically be that much worse than any other subculture, subgroup. But there they are, incarcerated at a higher level. And this all perpetuates the cycle of poverty and low education. I could uh, step back again and let my uh, Pacific Islander students take over for me here. I have a little bit more personal history with this culture, with some of these cultures anyway, than others. And uh, I sp I've spent a lot of time with uh, the Filipino culture in particular. And, and I've always been impressed with any culture that encourages young people to be res respectful of their elders, to not just respect them and, and honor them, but to feel obligated to care for them. That's something that happens really consistently in the Asian population and, and Pacific Islanders. It also happens often, but not quite as often in the black populations. But you know what? We Caucasians, we're just falling down on the job. We're like, where's the closest home we can put grandma in? So, it, you know, if you look culturally at, at the different groups, we certainly uh, treat our elders differently, we treat our children differently, and we value education differently. Uh, the nice thing about this group is they tend to be very respectful of teachers. Um, even if they don't like you, they're going to keep their mouth shut and listen in your class. They're going to do whatever, you know, projects you tell them to do. And you know I'm talking to a couple of you in this class. <laughs> I'm saying I like you. I like you all. Anyway, uh, it's usually a, a pleasure to have people like this in your class. Sadly, Native American culture is someplace that we probably all are in need of, of extra education. The way our society was set up, Native Americans were moved from their ancestral homeland to reservations, sometimes very far away, sometimes under really awful circumstances, and they were basically left to, to die. Our government did very little to protect them. As a matter of fact, did quite the opposite, attempted to wipe them out on a couple of occasions, uh, and then did nothing to try to protect them for decades. There were, there were um, committees in Congress, and there still is, there's a committee in Congress of uh, Native American, um, I'll look this up and get back to you on this, but Native American dealings they set up schools where they made every attempt to wipe out their culture. They took, they were boarding schools. They took children away from their parents, forcibly took them away, put them in these boarding schools where the, they were usually run by nuns, parochial schools. They were really awful. You know, they, there were all kinds of, of legitimate stories of children being beaten and starved and they were forced to try to learn outside of the context of their own background. So they were really trying to, they were being forced into the mold of teaching white children when in fact these kids often had no background, no foundational knowledge to build on. So it was, it was really awful. The abuse was, was pretty horrendous. And if you have any interest in this, you can, you can Google some of this stuff and, uh, and see it's, is pretty bad. But that aside, what it means for us right now is that we've, we've kind of woke up. And a lot like slavery where we're, we're waking up now and, and most white people, whether our families own slaves or not, would say, well, we're really sorry for what happened to your ancestors, to any black person whose family may have had people held in slavery. I think we all feel roughly the same way about about Native Americans where we all just want to apologize on behalf of, of things that previous white people did even if those people were not 
in our direct line of ascent. But that means that today we're, we're just now doing research that we need to do to figure out how best to educate these people in conjunction with their Native American heritage. There are a lot of different tribes and each tribe has very distinct cultural differences, um, needs, desires, expectations. Some of the societies are patriarchal, some are matriarchal. There's just a lot of a lot of differences and for most of us it's really hard to learn the specifics of 500 different tribes. So I think the easiest things to do in these situations is just simply to ask. Most people want to talk about their culture and they feel honored if you ask them and if you just say hey this is what I need to teach you is there anything special that we should talk about if you're trying to set up a teaching set situation a seminar something where, you, where there's a lot of people involved then maybe you could go to one of the tribal elders and say this is what we need to do is there a way that we can bring in um, maybe your beliefs in nature or um, past experiences can we bring those fold them into the lesson to make it more meaningful for the learners and I think that if you're just really kind and respectful you would get more help than you ever imagined and to be honest they'll probably do 90% of the work for you overall I guess the number one thing you should take away from this is to notice differences but don't stereotype just because there are differences between people doesn't mean that they absolutely are in one group or another most stereotypes are negative they're almost always negative and they're usually deep-seated and they came from our parents and we don't really have much control over them most of them are subconscious about the only thing you can do is start to pay close attention to your own reactions um, I know that the way I was raised there were certain people that if I found myself on an elevator with I instinctually feel irrational fear it's it's completely wrong I shouldn't I should feel you know typical fear where everyone should be concerned most women are afraid when they get into an elevator with any man by themselves I mean there's there's just an inherent danger that lurks in that situation and that's sad but that's true but the race of that person should be irrelevant to that fear so you have to stop yourself you have to stop and think you know this fear is irrational I'm gonna be friendly and I'm gonna see what happens sometimes people take advantage of that Sometimes people are friendly, sometimes people are rude. But what's the old saying? You get more flies with honey than vinegar? That works. That works. It's really true. When it comes to older people, make sure that you are respectful. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Call them Mr. or Miss. I very rarely call an older person, say, in their 60s or 70s. I very rarely call them by their first name. Unless they ask me to call them by their first name, I'll make a point to call them Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. Such-and-such, whatever their name is. Because I just, that's, you know, in their generation, that was how you were respectful to them. That's, that was how they were respectful to their elders, and they, they um, expect that of you. And it, it bothers me quite a bit when I see my students or um, other coworkers who just walk in the first time they meet somebody older and just call them by their first name. There's just an inherent disrespect. So just keep all these little things in mind and you'll be in good shape. You also need to keep these things in mind when, you, when you're creating learning plans. So, and if you know that you're going to have a mixed group, then you can treat it one way. If you know your group is primarily made of women in the domestic violence shelter, well then you certainly want to deal with that differently. Make sure you have females teaching them and not men. By the same token, if you're working in uh, a, a homeless shelter for mostly men, you may not want women in there teaching them, not because the women are in any type of danger, but perhaps the women don't have the same life experiences as men do, and maybe the men will more easily relate to them. Okay, that's all for this chapter, but I do have uh, one more little lesson that I'm going to tack on to the end of this. Thanks.